Hey everyone, thank you for joining us for another CSAM webinar. Um, we're going to get started here in just a couple minutes. I keep seeing our number up, so um, just another minute and we'll get started. Okay, so I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone. I'm Caitlin Potis and I'm the Secretary Elect for Collectionship Professional Network of AAM. For us for our webinar, we are going to be talking about the fundamentals of museum integrated management today. Just a couple of logistics for Zoom. Um, we are doing a webinar, so you can see us but we can't see you. If you want to talk to each other, and use the chat feature, say hi, tell us where you're from. Have questions throughout the webinar, use the Q&A feature, and I'll be keeping an eye on that um, as we go along. And we'll bring up your questions at the end. Um, this webinar is being recorded. And we will share it at a later date on this collection stewardship YouTube channel as well as our website. If you have any trouble with Zoom, um, you can go to the Help Center. The link is here, or you can um, shoot me a message in the chat or an email. Um, keep an eye on my email as well. Um, okay, so I'm going to introduce you to our speaker today. Krista D.C. Quinn is with us from the University of Illinois Spurlock Museum. And she is uh, the collection manager at the University of Illinois Spurlock Museum. She has over 30 years of experience in museum collections preservation. She's a certified technician for general use pesticides in Illinois, a certified mold remediation worker, and her IPM at the Spurlock was the first museum to earn Green Shield certification. She teaches museum collection preservation in the School of Information Science at the University of Illinois and serves as a faculty associate of Ontario's Willowbank School of Restoration Arts, is an instructor at the Center for Collections Care at Beloit College, and is a reviewer for the AAM MAP program. Fundamental Museum in, that was published in 2019 has been voted 100 times in 46 countries. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Krista. Welcome. Hello, thanks so much. Let me share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. Excellent. Let me get my mouse where I see it. Okay. So I am so happy um, to be here today to um, talk about my book, uh, Fundamentals of Museum IPM, and also for those who um, want to start an integrated pest management program or for those who may already have an integrated pest management program. Let's give a little bit of history about integrated pest management. Pests have always presented a major threat to artifact preservation. Since the 18th century, museums have used pesticides to control harmful invaders. 
In fact, it used to be common practice for a museum to treat artifacts and collections areas with toxic chemicals such as arsenic and mercury. Until the 20th century, pesticides were used indiscriminately and often sources of pest infestations were never found. As a result, artifacts that were treated became contaminated and damaged. Many pesticides that were standard pest management practices are now illegal due to health risks they may pose to humans, the environment, and non-target species. We still find traces of pesticides on artifacts today. In 1979, a presidential directive mandated that the country come up with a new strategy to deal with pests. And this was called Integrated Pest Management, or IPM be adopted on federal properties to address ongoing environmental and health concerns surrounding pesticide use. It fell upon the National Park Service and the Smithsonian Institution to develop IPM policies that met unique needs of cultural and historic properties. However, it was not until the publication um, in 1998 by uh, Zuckerman that the IPM concept as a concept was um, understood and widely accepted. So we see here some pictures um, from Getty Images and my mother is old enough to have run, run behind the DDT truck when they used to spray for mosquitoes. So this was something that you used to see in towns, just general blatant use of pesticides. And even when I started training in museums, we were using pesticides on collections. So let's first have our first poll, is that possible? Are we running the poll, Caitlin? Yes, okay. So if everybody would be willing to answer this poll, um, I don't get to vote. I just saw at the bottom, that's great. <laughs> Caitlin, are they answering the poll? Yep, yeah, answers are coming in. We were, I'm gonna stop it in just another second. All right. Okay. Okay, how'd the poll come out? Oh, excellent. So about 77% of people answered yes, that they do have an integrated pest management. 19% um, answered no, and 4% answered, I'm not sure. I think that that's also great answers here. So this, this talk is gonna be for everyone today. Um, do you have, um, if you checked yes, do you have written policy and procedure? Uh, to be part of your integrated pest management policy. Awesome, 63% of you do. 85% um, of people inspect for pests and then about 88% monitor for traps, monitor with traps, excellent. So those are just some general tenants of museum IPM. So when I started looking at, you know, I was not necessarily trained as I told you, I was trained in more of like, um, you know, using pesticides at first on artifacts. Um, I started training and looking into integrated pest management when I started to get a lot of infested collections, um, which happened in the um, early 90s. And so I had been working in the pest management field for a long time. Um, I have my certification in structural pest control and in mold remediation. But I found that even when I was teaching workshops or other museum people that often we didn't know where to start and sometimes people feel really overwhelmed. So in um, 2018, I ended up getting, yes, 2018, I ended up getting a grant from the North Central IPM Center. And um, they gave me enough money to produce a book, which I hope you were able to download before this workshop. If not, it's available for free and I will have the post at the end of the workshop. Um, and this is a book to kind of start you off on different ways to think about integrated pest management. Um, also, uh, those who helped me with the book would be uh, Green Shield. So there were some people at the Green Shield program that helped me um, put together um, parts of this book the North Central IPM Institute and um, some colleagues. And if you've never gone to museumpest.net, it is an excellent resource for looking at um, IPM programs and pests that attack collections. 
Essentially, integrated pest management isn't a rigid scientific term for instant pest control. I consider IPM a lifestyle. It offers a toolbox of cultural, mechanical, and physical strategies to control pests. By inspecting for pests and signs of pests, monitoring potential infestations, and removing pest conductive conditions, and we'll talk about that in a bit, and proactively excluding pests from your building through proper maintenance, it is possible to safely and effectively protect and maintain your museum's collections without relying on pesticides. We do not use any pesticides here at the Spurlock Museum. Um, that is uh, one of the tenets of being Green Shield certified. Um, so we are able to really keep our pests down through a rigorous integrated pest management program. So what does that consist of? Um, there's four core steps to museum um, pest, you know, to IPM success is inspect. So if you find something, maybe it's on an artifact. If you find it, isolate that artifact and start looking, starting to know, you know, where and why and the how of pest activity. Isolate the object and then look around the area to see what's going on. Step two, monitoring. Okay, so maybe you don't see something on your artifacts, but how do you know you have any pests? It's amazing to me when I go to some museums, they're like, we don't have any pests. And I'm like, really? Do you monitor for pests? Well, no. <laughs> well, then how do you know? So well-placed monitors can tell you quite a bit. Um, there's many different types of monitors. Um, in this building, we generally use what's called a blunder trap. It's a sticky trap and insects walk through it. So it kind of tells you what's going on in those spaces. Um, if you do nothing else, so just say we don't have time for steps one and two, step three is really important sanitation. If nothing else, clean up. Use a really good HEPA vacuum. So that's essentially cleaning is monitoring. If you have a really clean space, you can tell if something has happened in it. You know if there's insects presence, maybe there's cobwebs. If you vacuum on a regular basis, you know what's going on in your building. And then step four is keep pests out in the first place. Really stay on top of your building, really excluding the pest out. So how does integrated pest management happen? It's teamwork. Without teamwork, your integrated pest management program will fail. So when I asked about policy, policy is really, really important. So go on to the Spurlock's website, come steal my policy. It's generally, it's on environmental monitoring, but it talks about how you, you know, that we do look out for pests and that we are committed to an integrated pest management program. Every staff member at the museum signs an integrated pest management, basically a pest management agreement saying that they'll only eat in certain areas, that they will look out for pests, that they will clean up their areas. So we educate people, we get them to do um, buy-in. So we look at all the different types of people involved in the museum, whether it's security, exhibition, education, um, you know, visitors, you know, and the collection staff tends to be core of this, but the reason why I put the building maintenance person in the middle is without your building service worker, without your janitor, you're, you don't have an integrated pest management program. It's through the removal of trash or sanitation that really is a core feature of your integrated pest management program. Also, the, your building maintenance worker is cleaning all the time, looking at your building. So really they are key. So it's really educating. If you're not friends with your building service worker, become friends with them. So I have to thank the staff at the Spurlock Museum. First, um, our building service worker, Jimmy Hudson, he is amazing. Um, he actually used to be a pest management professional and then um, to get better benefits, he moved into the university and he is absolutely wonderful. And my collections team is extraordinary. And I have IPM student staff, Ilali Song, who um, worked on me with the book, and Janet Ju, who helped put together this, um, basically helped me cut apart the book to put together this PowerPoint presentation today. So four core steps. So how I, how I set up the book is there's several different ways. And I love flow charts. I, you'll see, I like different ways of putting together infographics, putting together different types of information. Sometimes I find blocks of text or some websites to be really hard unless you know what you're navigating for. This book is treated as if you've never done it before, so you could step right into an infographic and go in. As a person who has a learning disability, a reading disability, this is a lot easier for me to read and look at. So 
we're looking at pest conductive um, conditions. So it starts with inspecting, look for signs of pests, actual pests like poo or stuff like that, pest conductive situations. So if you have that messy office made or somebody didn't clean up after their lunch, monitor that we're looking at traps. So there's the blender traps that I talked about, the things walk into, there's pheromone traps, ones that actually have pheromones in it to attract pests in. But then you need to keep track of that. So you need to have some type of record keeping. So sanitation, again, removing conductive situations. So removing things like food, water, waste and other shelter and just really having good housekeeping is a core principle of this. And then exclusion, you know, looking at your routine maintenance of your building, pest proofing and sealing openings. So let's break it down. So step one is really about um, proper inspection is, the found, is one of the foundational things. So what are really great tools to have? Flashlights. You can see the artifacts from different positions with a flashlight and also having a magnifying device. I happen to have a stereoscope at my museum, but if you don't have one, you can always use your phone's camera and zero in on something. There's plenty of listserv like Museum Pests that will help you ID pests, but magnifying lens tweezers are actually to remove pests or look at, get into certain areas on artifacts to actually see what is going on. Also inspect an area around an artifact. So um, look at, you know, in clothing, look at inside of pockets, um, you know, look into, you know, baskets, look inside of things. If something's dirty, it may more likely have had pests there. Look for presence of frass. Frass is a fancy way of saying waste or excrement from insects or, re, um, re, you know, skin and other debris that comes off of insects. And then look at what's around the artifact. Quite often, if you're seeing spider webs, spiders set up where there's food, so that may indicate that there is a problem there. And then shine a light, you know, um, shine lights on dark areas, you know, turn over and lightly tap the artifact. Sometimes that may shake something out. So um, also check new artifacts as they arrive. Many museums have short-term or external storage for incoming objects to be quarantined. The Warhol, my colleagues over there are amazing. They didn't have a quarantine room. So what they, they did is they actually bought a camping tent and they open up their artifacts inside the tent. So then if anything is live or flying out, it's trapped within the tent. I thought that was super brilliant. So even if you don't have a quarantine room, you know, try and isolate, inspect artifacts as they come in. If we can't inspect all of them, we bag the boxes and we bag things before they move into a general artifact area. So where do I start? Okay, so sometimes it's like, oh, you know, I'm one person, I'm doing multiple jobs at my facility, I don't know where to start. So, you know, pick some low hanging fruit. So maybe it is installing a door sweep. So that's something that goes on the bottom of a door to kind of prevent insects or other things from coming in. Door sweeps are an amazing and cheap tool to keep artifacts from coming in. Uh, not artifacts, um, insects from coming in. So if we're looking at like, if you see any cracks of light outside when you're inside your building and you can see the light coming in, if you see holes, that's anytime you have a hole or a crack or an opening, that's a place for a pest to get in. So you can also use metal mesh and screen. There's repellent types of products as well that can be used and sealing cracks are really important. Cleaning, I cannot emphasize cleaning is so important. So really, good housekeeping, reduce clutter. You know, there's, you know, you, uh, I'm not sure if you're that person, but every office has that one person who has the super messy office. See if they can pick it up or even in your storage areas, are you storing a lot of extra material that are not artifacts in your storage area? Can you remove them? Anything that makes it easier for you to look around and see what's going on is really important, especially in your storage areas because if you can just walk through and do a quick inspection with a flashlight shining a light down, that's really much easier than if you have a bunch of boxes in the way, if you have a bunch of tools in the way, if you have a bunch of carts in the way, how often are you taking out your trash? How often are you, you know, vacuuming? So in our museum, we happen to have a couple different HEPA vacuums here. So we are generally cleaning almost, you know, at least once a year we do a deep clean. Other than that, we try and keep things clean as often as possible. So culturally, 
We don't allow plants in our museum, any live plants. Now that's really not a popular move, but quite often a lot of potted plants, they can harbor a lot of mold, other insects. Now, if it's something where culturally you need to have that in your museum, I've known some museums that happen to have like cut flowers being brought in every day by donors. If that's something that is important, doesn't mean, it just means you happen to have a little bit more pest load in those areas. So you just need to keep an eye on it. We, I cannot stress enough that we, you really need to have trash cans with lids for anything that is food waste. So if people, if people can eat in one area in your museum, ask that people bring, don't eat their food, you don't litter um, food in their offices, that they actually bring it out to a covered trash can. And then just again, be friends with your janitor. So covered trash cans are usually a pretty fast and easy place to start. So uh, when I'm doing consulting for integrated pest management for historic structures, I generally say, hey, get a covered trash can, put some door sweeps in, look at your seals, look at your cracks, look at all of that. Even before I'm asking how many pest traps are you putting down? Really, it's these things that are really pretty quick and you'll see some really expedited results. Also, how often are you taking trash out in other areas? So in your storage areas, in areas where there are artifacts. So just make sure you're doing regular maintenance that way. So effective IPM requires consistent surveillance of your museum for pest intruders. Um, it's not possible to observe every corner of your facility every day, but you can use traps or, or pheromone lures. So how many traps should you put around your museum? Well, I get asked this a lot. And what I would say is as many as you can check what regularly once a month. One trap checked regularly is better than multiple neglected traps. So if you need to do a priority, I would just say if you had one trap, where would you put it? So I would say usually where the most artifacts are. So in storage or around vulnerable artifacts. In exhibit areas, maybe places with lots of traffic. Usually up against walls or in corners, things that are dark, areas that are dark are really important. And it's easier, you'll be more likely to, to track pests that way. So we used to have in my building about 189 traps because I do this for research. Um, I have a student that works for me about eight hours a week um, that just does integrated pest management. But I started taking my own advice and seeing how much can I reduce the traps in my building. So I went from about 189 traps and that was between two buildings. So let's say about 160 traps in my main building to 37. And I was able to do that because after many years of tracking, I'm like, do I need a trap in every office? I believe people are following the rules. Like, where do I need traps? And it, it also took a tremendous amount of time, even with me checking them or with somebody who had expertise looking at them all the time to do that. So I think often we have too many traps. So I actually then looked at it even further, and I haven't done this yet, where you can I can think I can reduce my traps down to 21. Um, so I am able to look at the traps pretty quickly and do that, but if you don't have time, you're much better off cleaning somewhere first rather than setting multiples of traps. Um, so that's where I would go first is if you only had a couple of traps, maybe 10 traps, where would you put them first and set those and then see how, how much are you going back to them? How, how much time are you really spending on that? Because you know, we all don't have enough time and time is a resource. So here's another way in which you can think about um, pest management. So we can think about our pest present, yes or no. And this the whole theme of this flow chart is to continue monitoring. So you'll see every time it's like continue monitoring, continue monitoring. So our pest present, yes or no. Do pests uh, present an immediate danger to the staff or visitors? If yes, then you deal with that immediately. And that would be the case of, we happen to have at my museum, a wasp nest that was um, being built really close to where our visitors were coming in. So we dealt with that immediately. So that's something where we didn't wait around. Are the pests damaging your collection, yes or no? Are the pet, do the pests breed indoors or outdoors? If they're outdoors and they're coming in, it's showing you you have a hole in your building. Um, so again, going back to looking at your building, are there obvious entries for pests? Are the pests you know, completely outside? Are they feeding on a food source? If so, can you contain that food source? Are they confined to a single area? But every single time I'm like, 
please continue monitoring. So you always want to be aware of what's going on in your building and your spaces. Okay, so we're ready for poll number two. All right, does your path, does your museum or institution monitor for temperature and relative humidity? Looks like most people do, great. For those people that don't, you know, that's all right too. If you don't have the equipment, that's okay. Uh, maybe you just notice the temperature on the wall or what the temperature is outside. Um, we'll get to temperature in a little bit and why it's important. Um, does your, you know, um, does your museum or institution regularly vacuum or clean? Inside of exhibit cases, about 37% do. In and around storage units, 78, what? That's awesome. And neither of these areas, 19. Okay, well, let's talk about, so cleaning is monitoring. So in general, the hotter the temperature, the more pest activity you're gonna have. So I think, I'm hoping that most of us have maybe noticed this, that when it's warmer out in the summertime, you happen to have more pest activity. Maybe there's more bugs flying around and everything else. The same thing is happening in your building. The warmer it is, the more likely you're gonna have pest activity. The cooler it is, less likely of pest activity. So it just may be noticing that, right? At this point, it's fall um, in Illinois. So we happen to have a lot of pests trying to push into our building because it's super chilly outside. You can also monitor for clutter. So if you're not monitoring for temperature and relative humidity, you can monitor for clutter pretty easy. So again, that messy coworker or that person who really likes to save boxes, those are pest, you know, basically those are pest hotels. They love clutter. So if you're able to reduce your clutter and you're able to clean, that is, mon that is monitoring. Every time you clean, you recognize, hey, I clean that surface. I see, a, uh, you know, if I, if I knew I vacuumed there recently or I cleaned around my storage area recently and suddenly I see ants or I see, you know, some spider webs, I realize that they are dead bugs. Oh, those are new. I re recently vacuumed. I know those are new. And then you could start tracking the problem from there. So sanitation, every living thing needs food, water, and shelter to survive. Improving your sanitation reduces access to food and leaves your museum inhospitable to pests. Your first line of defense should always be a trusty vacuum cleaner. And I can tell you that the data supports this. So I, I say, so here it says cleaning reduced pests by 80%. So domestic beetles, so it's a type of, it's a set, you know, like um, many different types of beetles that attack um, hair, skin, feather, furs. And we happened, you know, we track these pretty regularly. As I said, I have at least, you know, I think at that time I was running my 120 traps at the museum. We did a deep clean vacuum. That meant that we vacuumed around moldings. We deeply vacuumed every rug. We had the entire staff, every October, the entire staff, except for this year in COVID, um, my collection staff did it this year. We clean every office top to bottom. We clean every space top to bottom, including storage, wipe everything down, vacuumed everything off. And after we did that deep clean in November, the pest traps, all of the domestics in the pest traps fell by 80%, eight zero. That is huge just by doing a deep clean. And that's just by getting everybody on board. So those people who are like, oh, you know, I want to eat my office. I want to do this. Well, do you want pesticides? Do you want more of that? Honestly, it was just cleaning. So you should regularly vacuum your display areas. I mean, that's what the public sees anyway. So, and I think it's great that we're vacuuming our storage areas, floors, windows, edge moldings, and make sure to empty your vacuum clean or bag contents daily. If you can't tape over the, the, the 
you know, the nozzle of the vacuum. You just want to make sure that nothing gets out. You can also limit potential uh, food sources by designating areas where people, you know, are permitted to eat using, you know, um, covered garbage cans. The same thing goes for recycling. Really like recycling, but most people don't rinse it out properly. And if you leave any standing water in it, that is what pests like. They don't care that it has a little bit of, you know, like that the water's a little bit dirty. They're fine with that. So facility awareness. This is the last poll. Oh my God, yay, this is a lot higher than I thought. Um, do you regularly go into your mechanical rooms? 44% of you said yes, good job. 56% um, of you said no. I would say go take a visit when you have a chance. Your mechanical room is an area where a lot of pests will come in, especially if your drains are, are dry. You, We actually clean our mechanical rooms out. We vacuum them because I want to know what's going on. So my mechanical rooms are the cleanest on campus. Um, we need to, as collections people, if we're taking care of our collections, we need to know our building. So 72% of you said that you would be able to identify building maintenance issues. Faulty HVAC, which is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, cracks in foundation, leaky roofs or windows, overflowing gutters. No for 28% of you. That is not surprising. Um, when we were trained in the museum field, or at least when I was trained, you were trained to think about the artifact. Like that's what we get jazzed about like, yay, here's the things. Well, then we have our storage and enclosure and there's lots of classes to teach. How do we take care of all of that around it? And then there's the building environment, which we did talk about. A lot of people um, measure for temperature and relative humidity. Ah, but then there's the building. A lot of us don't think about the building. I wasn't trained um, when, you know, when I got my museum studies degree. I was not trained to look at buildings. I have spent the past 25 years and we built a new building learning about buildings. So an environment is knowing what season you're in, like we're getting close to winter here in the Midwest. But if you're near, if you're in an urban area, if you're near an aquatic area, if you're near a forested area, they're gonna have different pests. So it, you can clean all you want, but if you like, what you if you allow pests to enter your building, you never truly eliminate an infestation. So yeah, I talked about the importance of cleaning, but you really need to look at your building envelope. So your building envelope is the physical barrier between your museum and the outside world. So cracks and openings that penetrate your envelope can open you up to an invasion of, you know, of insects. So some insect, most insects prefer dark, tight spaces. Sealing cracks and crevices in your building envelope is the equivalent to posting a large eviction sign. Poor maintenance can draw more pests to your museum. So look at what your lights are. I look at my building in the rain. So I've gone outside and watched my building when it is pouring outside to see is the, is the water being removed from my building? What does my building look like at night? Are there pests around? Like look at your building in different weather, look outside. Get to know, if you have facilities people, get to know them, get to know your building. Your building is, really protecting your artifacts. We need to be more aware of our building. So from there, let's look at, when I look at a building, I look at, you know, we can of course look at the interior. I look at how the water is removed from the building. So are there any protruding structures? Are there eaves? Like what does the roof look like? Light. Often we can pull insects into our buildings. I've worked um, with historic houses that kind of kept like little mood lighting around the building and it was just bringing pests in because some pests are photophilic. They really like moths, they really like to be near light. Now those moths don't necessarily attack our collections but they attract other pests which then may get into the building later. 
So look at your exterior walls, your foundation. So you're seeing here a picture of our weedy, but our inorganic barrier around our building. So if you can, try and have at least three feet around your building that's inorganic or stone. This way, again, it's like a clean area for you to be able to walk around so you can see what's going on in your building. So also anything that's coming into your building, quarantine and inspect anything coming in before you know, before you release it into the general population of your artifacts. So I did not talk about specific pests until slide 20. So often, even in this book, I have pests at the very back. Generally, people get really zoned in on the pests. It's really about a lot of other things in integrated pest management. But let's talk about if you have crickets, they're not eating your collection necessarily, but what is it telling you? They're humongous. So that means that you have a big opening in your building. Ground beetles too. You have large openings. They don't live in our buildings. They stumble in and they're like, oh no, I'm in a building. Well, we let them in because we had an opening. House centipedes usually mean moisture. Sosas are very, very tiny and they normally mean, you know, like mold, you have mold issues. Spiders, spider webs tell you, they set off shop where there's food. So it usually tells you there's some kind of pests walking through. So often if you have to set a monitoring trap, set it and where a, a um, where a spider web was. And then drain flies, they're these like, um, I, I believe I have them in the book. There are these flies that basically tell you that your drains are dry. So what is the formula for pest potential? You have pest access. So this is all about your building. Do you have cracks and gaps? Do you have building openings? Plus, if you have building openings, plus you have food, water, and clutter, that equals your pest potential. So this has nothing to do with the actual pest. This has to do with all of the things that are culturally around your artifacts. So Reducing pest conditions. So if you reduce the water, so look at leaks. How is the water being removed from your building? Do you have roof leaks? Do you have pipe leaks? Um, are the mop buckets from your BS, you know, from your building service worker emptied at night? Are people leaving dishes? I used to, when, before the museum moved, we didn't have a dishwasher and yeah, we had one bad office mate that never did the dishes. We actually have a dishes list now because we're kind of awful about not doing the dishes unless somebody's assigned to it. Are there, you know, is there people food around? Are there other bugs? Other bugs are food for um, dermestids and other things that then will eventually attack your collection. Dust, dirt is pest conductive and dust is also food for some pests like mold. Harborage, cardboard boxes, I cannot stress it enough. Please don't save them. You don't need them. If they're, if they're your supplies for actually taking care of your artifacts, elevate them, keep them clean. Also clutter, declutter. Um, look at your access, so seal up cracks, voids, and any sweepless doors, any doors where you could see underneath is a pest highway. So if you're looking at your IPM performance, you can look at your policy environment, your building maintenance, your sanitation, where the barriers are around, and then notice those cracks and voids. This is just a way in which you could dive in, look at the flow chart, be like, okay, how do I start? Where do I start? You know, do I have door sweeps? And then moving your way up to, do you have like, you know, do, do the pests have access? So I had a, a person call me up and say, hey, I have these dermestids in these baskets. And I had been in that museum about five years before. And I'm like, well, did you put a door sweep on your storage? They're like, no. And then when I was talking to them more, they were talking about that they actually had mice running into their loading dock because they had an opening. But that, yet they wanted to talk to me about a domestic inside, like a domestic problem inside the basket. I'm like, sure, you can vacuum it, you can treat that, but really, you're just going to put it back and not deal with these other mechanical issues. So really, broadly, can you deal with your building? You can look at that, do that first. Plus, it's more energy efficient. So you can also maybe argue to your administrators that hey, a better sealed building is more efficient, will pay it less in utilities. So. When I first started, I knew more about what my artifact was made of than I meant necessarily, you know, didn't know about pests themselves. So sometimes go with your comfort zone. So if your museum, if you feel like something's infested, there's a lot of them, you know, a lot of insects or pests, don't panic. You, you can basically look at First, what's in your materials? What's edible and inedible? So if it's like, a, like it's like a mug or something made out of ceramic or stone, you know that that one's safe. Go to the edible things. And the same thing with condition. Has it been previously infested? Stuff that's been previously infested generally will get infested again. It's like, I don't know, it's super tasty. 
is it dirty? Are your artifacts dirty? If they're dirty, they're more likely. So if you have to do a quick triage, is it edible? Yes, no. Is it dirty? Yes, no. Is it previously infested? Yes, no. That will allow you to kind of focus in on the artifacts you need to most. So this is taking maybe you're more comfortable that way. That's the way I used to do it before I started looking at the building. So here's just a flow chart and I have a giant one in the book, but this is just talking about like, hey, we know what material it is. So we're gonna focus on what's made of animals. So, you know, is it made of something from an animal? So is it a fur, feather, skin, bone, or horn? So there's soft tissue and hard tissue. So soft tissue is like fur, feathers, and skin. So what eats the soft tissue? So here's a couple of, you know, warehouse beetles, carpet beetles. So these are some of these dermestids I was talking about. Is the larva present? Yes or no? So this is maybe to help you identify a pest from the material type. So if you know what it's made of, then look at this chart and this may be able to help you out. On the flip side, hard tissue is often it's black carpet beetle, lar larder beetles eat a lot of these like bone, like basically horns, maybe unprocessed bone materials. So plants is a lot bigger, so I'm really not going to get into it. It's on page 20, but it talks about all the different types of things that um, plant materials that insects or pests get into. So what are the types of um, vulnerable objects maybe in a collection? So maybe this is something you know broadly. I know that bedding, costumes, rugs, shoes, specimens may be more likely to get infested. Books, furniture, masks, you know, objects with food residue. So we have baskets that were used to harvest food. So those are more likely to be infested than some of our other. And so we have animal and then protein things are like, you know, baskets, bowls, toys, you know, um, and you know, those kind of things we may be able to look at, okay, that's gonna be a different types of pet, you know, different type of pest. I generally am of the mind of there's a, there's a lot of people out there who are happy to answer like, what is this pest? And I think a lot of people zero in on that and they're, they're just really obsessed with, oh my God, I have this cricket or what's going on with this? And they want to ID the pest. I don't spend a lot of time on that. There's maybe about 25 things that you really need to be thinking about. But really, I'm looking at all of these other things that have to do with pest management. So I think that if you don't have a lot of time, start looking at all these other factors. And I'm hoping that this guide helps you to do that. So essentially is you don't need to, you can, you don't need to inspect all your, you know, your artifacts daily, monitor five different types of traps and keep every square inch of your museum spotless or seal every crack to practice IPM. You know, that level of IPM, I don't even do that. It's not necessary or possible. You could just, you know, try and keep it chill, do some good housekeeping, try and keep up with your building, you know, look at everything as much as you can. Um, and that's generally how I approach it. Go with what you know, and then start, you know, building out your program from there. So maybe it starts really small. Maybe it starts with one door sweep, one trap, and a vacuum clean. That's enough for now. So do, do we have any questions? And I will also put up, this is where you can actually download my IPM guide. Thank you so much, Krista. Um, we did have a question come through. Um, if you could talk a little bit about your inorganic barrier around the museum and what that material is or is. Some other examples of that material. Awesome. I am happy and thrilled that I'm getting a inorganic barrier question. It is rock. So it has like a weed barrier, usually about six to eight inches deep. Um, and you need to keep it free of weeds, which mine isn't, usually about three feet out. Um, ours, the picture I showed you is about 10 feet out. That's awesome if you can do that. If you have a, so I've worked with historic buildings that quite often you can't keep a three foot inorganic barrier around your building because it wasn't period. So for those um, buildings, I recommend pulling wood away from the building. So if you happen to have decking to allow you know, people to walk between historic buildings, make it out of that composite or that plastic decking, which looks like wood. Please don't use mulch. If any, if you learn anything, don't use mulch because mulch is super tasty wood that's great for plants, but it brings insects into your building. So what I recommend if you need to have a mulch look is to use rubber mulch. So it looks like mulch, 
but is not tasty to insects. So does that answer the question? Um, yeah, that's great. Um, so another question, um, for collection storage spaces adjacent to break room areas, what things do you do to create an IPM barrier against us in this area? All right, so I was working with a museum that actually ate right next to their collection storage area. And when I went into their inspect, when, when I went into, and I can stop my share now, so how do I do that? Escape. So when I went into, um, you know, their storage area, I looked underneath their shelves and I found Cheetos kicked underneath their storage cabinets. Um, I suggested that they do a door sweep and do a covered trash can and make sure that, you know, the trash is taken out every day. Also clean underneath your fridge and clean your microwave on a regular basis. And you'd be surprised what your toaster has in it. Because cockroaches quite often crawl into your toaster at night and eat everything out of it. It's super gross, but true. So, you know, really just keep your lunchroom really clean and put in a door sweep. And so I recommended for, you know, they didn't have any other place to eat. I recommended, hey, put a door sweep here, use a covered trash can and make sure that that trash gets taken out every single night. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Um, so Adam Johnson is asking what the most humane type of trap is for mice. Um, would it be a mouse trap or a sticky trap? Not a sticky trap. Okay, that's like yeah. boom, out of the gate. I wouldn't um, think so either. That, well, in I believe in Canada because I, I I work in Canada quite often. I do you know I teach there. They don't allow sticky traps. They find it inhumane, and I do too. Um, so not sticky traps. They are legal in the United States. I like snap traps. I like to see the body. I'm a comic book fan. So if you don't see the body, the villain comes up again. So they are often baits or different things. And some pest management professionals will tell you, oh, the mouse will get thirsty and go outside. That's not true. They'll just die somewhere and then attract pests somewhere else. I find snap traps to be the most humane. Are you, you know, but yeah, I mean, you have to set them properly and don't reuse them if you can avoid it. It'd be surprised. It's surprising how cheap we can be as museums. I have had people use sticky traps for insects, circle them, and then put them back. Um, when they're used, they're used, throw them out. They're a pest attractant. So I happen to use snap traps at the museum. Um, I tend to like Rex traps. They're easy to set. You open them up. They look like like little dinosaurs, kind of. So that's why they're called Rex traps. Um, I find them to be um, pretty useful. And I would just also look at the the type of food bait that you're using. Um, they usually used to recommend peanut butter, but with a lot of us having children visit our museums, um, some children are so allergic that the peanut butter will bother them. So that you need to look at like a type of you know um, yummy treat that will bring the mouse in as something that is not going to um, cause allergic reactions. So that's what I recommend. There are other types of baits and things like that. But again, I can't see the body. So I use snap traps. Great. There are live traps. You can, you can do that and check every day. And we've done live traps at the museum too. So if we know that we could check them every 24 hours, it's called a tip trap and you watch it and you make sure that the mouse, you have to check them every 24 hours or they lose their body heat and they die a very horrible death. So if you're not checking them, you're better off killing them. So um, that's what we use in our building. And but if you release them out and you have that hole in your building and they run back in, it's your fault. So close <laughs> your building. Um, so another person is wondering about anoxic environments. They are reaching anoxic environments and have come across a reusable bubble type chamber that you place oxygen scavengers. Oh yeah, along with a digital reader. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, practice? I think that's wonderful. I mean, I that is, you know, I'm mainly talking about the systems around preventing pests, not necessarily pest treatment. So these are questions that are around pest treatment, and that's perfectly fine. Anoxic treatment is wonderful. You're able to pull the oxygen out. It really does not harm the artifacts. However, if you are working with an anthropological collection and working with source communities, some source communities need artifacts to breathe. It's a different way of knowing. So I've worked with some native communities that are fine with heating or freezing artifacts, but they are not okay with removing the oxygen. So even though from, 
you know, from the pres you know, from the strictly scientific, it will not damage the artifact, but spiritually that is considered damaging the artifact. So we don't use that in some cases. So if you're working with a cultural collection, please check with your source communities that you're doing the appropriate thing. And they may not recommend freezing or doing some types of things. And some artifacts are meant to degrade. So if you're working for a cultural institution, yes, scientifically, that does not harm the artifact, but it may harm the artifact in a very different way. That's really interesting. I never thought about that. Yeah, so some artifacts need to be, you know, need to breathe. And in our case, we have some artifacts that need to be fed. So you're actually bringing food into collections areas, but recognizing that we just need to monitor around those artifacts a little bit more. If, a, if an artifact to be preserved culturally needs to have its spirit fed, you, we need to respect that as preservation professionals and look at that there's other ways of knowing that if I'm doing my job, excluding things out of my building and doing all these other systems of cleaning and vacuuming and all of that, I don't need to worry about some artifacts getting fed or some artifacts, you know, not being able to have anox treatment. I'm doing my job in many other ways and still being able to keep these artifacts alive in the ways that they need to be. Great. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process um, when you do find an infestation? So if you found, let's say, a moth infestation in some textiles what is your steps for isolation and eradicating that well i mean first i'm like what <laughs> so first it's like all right so we bag the artifact we separate it out from the other artifacts so then we have usually i'll put that aside if i just say i'm working by myself you generally i'm not i have you know i have students who work with me but if i if i'm you know let's take it as i'm one person working on isolate that bag that artifact up put it aside for now look around that area, see what's going on. You know, you can put out a light trap at night to see if it traps more things. Look for other things that are like that. So if it's like a wool piece, look for other woolen things, inspect those. So then I would look at, can I clean it off the artifact? Can I vacuum it off the artifact? Can I pull, like, is the pest live or dead? Can I pull it off the artifact? Can I vacuum it off? Can I check on it again? So just say I don't have a freezer or a heat unit or anox, so what do I do? I have a vacuum or I have a pair of tweezers. I could pull the bugs off, okay? Then I bag it. I put a note on it that says, an alarm on my phone that says, hey, check me in six months. I go back and I see if there's other pest activity. That's a low tech way. We have a heat, you know, we have a heat unit here. We have freezing units so we can respond that way, but I can also just use good housekeeping. And then I look back in those areas of storage and I really keep up on monitoring those if it's a, you know, webbing or, you know, or um, webbing clothes moth or a case making clothes moth, maybe I put up a pheromone trap to see if I can find any more. So there's different ways in which it's not just the artifact, but I can clean the artifact. I can look at the area around the artifact. I can look at what I'm bringing in, but I look for like equals like. So I'm like, this is made out of this. Are there other insects in that area that are eating similar things? So is it bigger or smaller? Cool, thank you. Welcome. Um, so I know I'm not the only one who would have questions about getting staff buy-in. Okay. Um, do you have any suggestions for that? Get all of your staff and and hopefully to get um, you know the buy-in of upper management if you don't already have um, a facility staff in place. Like how can you all work together and get buy-in from everybody? Well. Um... Sometimes what I did um, to get a door, like to get a door sweep fixed is I put a trap down and I caught all the insects and I showed my boss, it, don't do this. I like put it on his desk and it was all full of bugs. Um, and then I showed him after we put the trap down, it like reduced the pests quite a bit. Essentially what I would show is start showing pictures of before and after um, to get staff buy-in. A lot of people don't like pesticides. They don't want that for the environment. I'm, you know, I think quite often we're very environmentally aware that using these chemicals or doing this is harmful. So if you're able to get people buying in that way, I answer people's personal pest questions. I find pests fascinating. So if they're asking something about their house, I'm like, yay, they're interested. I'll talk to them about it. So I try and answer questions. I educate the staff about that. Um, you know, trying to eat in certain areas at first, people wanted to eat in their offices, but now, I mean, COVID, it's a little different, but now we all eat together. So we all kind of get to know each other. That's kind of nice. So 
It is about continuing over and over again. I've known some of my colleagues at Museum Pest give away buttons, um, you know, give prizes and stickers for people who are doing things or asking questions. We have little IPM kits where people can catch stuff or let me know about it. Um, so just always be as enthusiastic as possible. Um, like, a, you know, and if you can get your management behind it, um, infested artifacts aren't good for anyone, meaning that it costs us money and time to deal with it and it damages artifacts and having pests in your building can freak out your visitors. So always use that angle. You know, like people don't wanna see pests. They just don't. So like whenever we see a bat in the building, it usually means a certain fan in our building isn't working. And people flip out when they see bats. They do not want them around. Um, you know, same thing with cockroaches. Like if we have some here, we're gonna have them other places. This doesn't make us look good. Generally, administration does not like that and they don't like talking about it. For years, I ran a really robust integrated pest management program, but I had a director that did not want me to talk about it. So I had to use code like we prep the artifacts for display, which meant we cleaned them because they were hideously infested. So that's what I do in general. And if you can kind of keep things pretty manageable, like first just do a covered trash can, try and get people to do that, then do one more step and one more step and compliment people when they do a good job. Yeah, so. great. Um, so one more question from uh, attendee. A starter recommendation for managing rooms that are naturally humid. Well, if you could get a dehumidifier, awesome. And if these don't have artifacts in them, I wouldn't sweat them as much as the places that do. Um, get rid of carpet if you can, or anything that's going to be hygroscopic or absorb water. So if you have carpeting in there, if you could get rid of that, awesome. If you can deal with some types of fans to keep the air moving and, you know, it's like a theme, clean. You know, clean up the space as much as you can, because if you have, if you have dust and you have moisture, you're going to have mold problems in general. So that's what I would recommend. Okay, great. And I have another question. You mentioned yeah. cardboard, um, and it made me wonder if pests are as attracted to like the acid-free materials that we so commonly use in fields, like blueboard or acid-free paper, like they are attracted to regular cardboard. Yeah, I mean, if it's E flute or or B flute, it's. It's a basically, it's a place for thigmotaxic pests, which is a fancy way of saying touch loving pests. Cockroaches, like German cockroaches, love jamming themselves into cardboard. Like, it doesn't matter to them whether it's fancy, expensive archival cardboard versus regular grocery store cardboard. I mean, one may have more food residue on it, but in general, I'm just saying that you just wanna, you know, we all like boxes. We just generally need to be inspecting them, making sure that they're clean. And we want that anyway for our artifacts if we're doing proper storage to so just inspect your stuff that you're preserving. That's what I do most of the time. And if it's a box coming in from outside, it's gone. We don't keep it around or we edge tape it. But yeah, it is just as tasty. I would say sometimes maybe the alkaline or some of the treatments may not be, but in general, consider a lot of the stuff we have, if it's edible, it may be tasty to something. Gotcha. Uh, I think we have time for one. So this person has gotten some pushback from staff from pests in public areas because people think we have a pest problem. Um, do you have any suggestions for using traps or addressing this in a different way? Well, I think that you can label your traps as we are monitoring as part of like what I what I've done is <laughs> so I have my heat tent up in the galleries because that's the only place we don't blow a, uh, um, an actual circuit. So we put it in the center of our museum, we're treating for pests. And we put up a sign that talks about it. And if I'm upstairs, I'll talk to visitors about it. People think that if you have monitoring traps down, you have a pest problem. No, what we're doing is we're monitoring so we don't have a pest problem. I know it's a PR thing, but maybe putting a label and just owning it, pointing down and saying, hey, this is what this is for. This is part of museum preservation. We're so deep behind the scenes in preservation and registration and that kind of thing. We don't really talk about what we do. And people think magically everything comes in that is perfectly clean and pristine and out there and labeled. And we know everything about it. There's loads of work that we're doing behind the scenes. So label it, put a little label, maybe point down it and say, why is this here? Educate the public about it. Now, and, and, you know, that may be useful. They may be like, wow, I hadn't thought about that. And, you know, what does it mean to do this? 
So we kind of own it. Like I, like I said, it's dead center in our gallery and we just put it right out there and we're like, and we even put it on Facebook. Hey, we're treating stuff today. Come on in. And so we own that we have stuff that's infested. We talk about the pest traps, but I'm saying double down on owning it. <laughs> Megan just said visitors thought that her varied carpet beetle pheromone for CIA listening devices. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, man, visitors are fun. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people take it personally. We get donations from people and they'll find out that their pieces were infested and they take it really personally. And I'm like, mm. they're just doing what they're supposed to be doing. Everything in nature is meant to be recycled. So we want these pests. We just don't want them in our facility, but like a cockroach is part of the food web. Mold is the great recycler. It recycles everything. So we just don't want it eating our collections, but if we didn't have mold, we did trash, you know, piles of trash everywhere. So these organisms serve a purpose. We just don't want them in our spaces. So I think that we just need to talk about that they shouldn't be in our spaces, but this is, they, ha they, they have an inherent purpose. I'm really not about killing things if I don't have to be. I'm about pushing them out of the space and making it inhospitable. Great. Well, thank you so much, Krista. This has all been so interesting and helpful. I know I've learned a lot and okay. I hope everybody else has too. Um, if you didn't get the um, link, well, I'll send it out to the listserv again so you can download the book. I know I have it um, saved on my hard drive. So um, thank you so much again. And we hope People you'll- People are welcome to event. email me as well. Um, so you can also email me if you, if you have a burning question or something like that that the book has not answered. I really appreciate the opportunity today. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. We're signing off now. Bye, everyone. Bye.